Hi everybody, this talk is about if you should read Kafka as a stream or in batch. We're going to pit batch against stream and see what comes out. We'll start with stream. Stream is basically doing micro deliveries, doing many small trips, and as a result, you get low wait times. Data comes in and very quickly gets delivered. Batch, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. We make large deliveries. We make few trips as a result of that. But you also have longer waits until your data arrives. So this is a story about a stream that has gone batch. We'll tell you a story of a project we've done that used to be a stream, and we turned it into batch. And we'll see what the differences were and why it made a lot of sense. We'll go over stream versus batch, some of the trade-offs, how we re-architected our stream to a batch, and we'll conclude with some considerations that will make sense for you to consider while looking at your projects as well. Before we start, I want to explain who we are. My name is Ofer Dubrovsky. I'm a big data dev lead at Nielsen, and with me is Idon Nadler, a big data engineer at Nielsen. We deal with data pipelines, serverless infrastructure, Spark clusters, and data analytics. We are part of Nielsen Marketing Cloud, and we build marketing segments and device graphs that can be used for running marketing campaigns and for making business decisions. Uh, in a nutshell about Nielsen Marketing Cloud, we are cloud native. We process a lot of data every day, roughly 60 terabytes of new data every day, and we store a total of about five petabytes in our data lake. We're heavy users of Spark, roughly 6,000 nodes every day um, across all our Spark clusters, and we're heavy users of Lambda functions that we also use in some of our pipelines. All right, let's talk about stream versus batch trade-offs. We're going to pit batch against stream, and we're going to do it right now. And to do that, I want to use an analogy of something with all something we're all familiar with, which is pizza delivery. So on the left, we have batch, our new champion, which is using a pizza delivery truck to deliver pizzas in batch. And on the right, we have stream our lightweight previous champion, which delivers pizzas using delivery scooters that can carry three to four pizzas in each delivery. The challenge is to deliver pizzas to a party going on at a house, and we'll compare the differences between doing it in each of those ways. So let's look at speed. If we have 20 pizzas to deliver to a house, and we are using the pizza delivery truck, that probably will take longer. The truck needs to wait until all the pizzas are ready. And then driving through the city will also take longer for the truck. So the total delivery time will be 45 minutes. If, however, we use the pizza delivery scooters, each one can pick up the pizzas as they arrive and head off immediately to the house. So delivery time will be faster. They also drive faster through the city. So we expect 15 minute delivery time and the pizzas are gonna arrive as they flow out of the oven. So in terms of speed, the stream option is faster. However, if we look at cost, the pizza delivery truck uh, costs $40 for each run. But if we have 20 pizzas, the truck can deliver all of them at once. So the cost per unit is going to be just $2, $40 for the uh, delivery divided by 20 pizzas. But the scooters will need six runs. So the 20 pizzas and the cost per run is going to be much cheaper, just $10. But still, that works out to be $3 per unit, much more expensive, 50% more. So the stream, even though it's faster, we actually have to pay for that. It costs more. And if we look at high loads, if you compare this to data, this is when you have to reprocess a lot of data that uh, was held up somewhere. Uh, there's also a big uh, difference here. 
the truck high load in our example is if we if we had to deliver a hundred pizzas so the truck could still deliver all of them in one run it's still 45 minutes but the stream to deliver the 100 pizzas will need to make five runs with each scooter five runs times 15 minutes that's going to take 75 minutes so not only is it more expensive it's also going to take longer to deliver so you can see that in some scenarios the stream is worse off in all dimensions both speed and cost so should we go with stream or batch in some cases the answer is obvious if you need real-time data then you go with a stream you just need real data no other choice but if you need a lot of aggregations so basically that means you have to wait until all your data arrives before you can do any aggregation you would go with batch because you have to wait anyways but what about all these cases in the middle where you could do either one of them and and it's up to you to decide so to take a look at that option let's see an example system and to do that i'm going to pass it on to ido which will tell you all about it ido thank you offer let's meet our system it's one of our core systems that process huge amount of data every day this data is being used widely in our company it's a simple ETL pipeline that uses Spark and consume, that consumes its data from Kafka. This Kafka cluster is being fed by other Kafka clusters spread around the world in our data centers. And the results are being written to our data lake in sitting on AWS in S3. Now, since we have constant stream of data coming along the day, we use Spark streaming. And because, let's face it, streaming is very cool, right? Overall, we process around 60 terabytes of data every day, which is a lot. Now, if we dive into one of our pipelines then, then, that use a specific topic we call delivery, in this specific topic, we process around 20 terabytes of data every day. So in order to be able to consume such amount of data, we defined this Kafka topic to run with 1,250 partitions. Now, the way Spark cluster Spark work is that each Kafka consumer is running on top of Spark executor that uses its own core. So overall, we are running 1,250 cores, all running together. There, and the results are again same amount of files being written to S3. In a nutshell, every few minutes we consume a micro batch from Kafka. We run some transformation on, on this data, and the results are being written uh, to S3 as parquet files. Well, sounds simple, right? It works perfectly for us, but in time, Reality eats us, and we found some issues with this system. I'm going to explain. So if we take a look at our stream of data, it varies during the day. So we found out that during the low hours, our cluster is underutilized, which means we are paying for resources we do not need. On the other hand, on peak hours, when the traffic exceeded the cluster capacity, we were starting to drag behind. Now, let's talk about your birthday. You don't want to miss your birthday due to production issues, right? Well, in our case, it wasn't your birthday, but it did was a, a Christmas Eve. So, two years ago, on Christmas Eve, we found out that our system was down and we were starting to lose data. Now, the reason for that is because we, uh, Kafka has a, a retention policy, which was in our case two days, and because of an outage, uh, the system was down and when we uh, started to consume the data again, 
we were consuming uh, offsets with which of data that was already deleted by Kafka. So we, we quickly uh, went and increased the, the, the retention policy, uh, but we figured out that uh, we have a recovery issue and we are losing data. So we, we then understood that when you need to architect your system, you really, really think you need to think about recovery because recovery is a, is a ticking time bomb. And we will show you later how we fix that issue. Regarding cost, well, system, systems and, and machines cost money, right? So in our case, it cost a lot. The, the, the amount of dollars we needed to pay for every year was $400,000. That's a lot. So we thought it has to be a better way and we have to rethink and architect, re-architect our system. Our, the project goals was to build a system that can be a quickly auto scale according to the traffic coming along the day. This will also fix the delivery, the delay issues we have on peak hours. Regarding cost, we have to improve our efficiency and cluster capacity so we can uh, gain some cost cutting. And regarding recovery, as you said, as we said before, we, we, we knew that recovery uh, system, uh, the able to recover from failure is a must. So, we thought that we have to sp we need to spread the work uh, across isolated workers. That way, we can tailor each one of those those workers to better efficiency. But how? So we took all of our, of our smart engineers, put them on the same room, ordered some pizza with scooters, of course, and we thought on how to do that. What we realized that if we look at our stream of data, if we use discrete time slots, we fix amount of time, let's say hours, for example, and we, we can look at each one of those hours as a separated task that you can tailor according to the amount of data it needs to process. So by spinning more and more tasks during the day, we can isolate the work from the workers and basically uh, uh, run multiple uh, EMRs uh, in, a isola in a full isolation system. If we take a look on it on the task perspective, each hour is a task. Some of them are very short, shorter than an hour, which means that we can process an hour of data in less time. And some of them takes longer than an hour, according to the traffic that comes to that arrives to Kafka during that hour. But that's okay, right? Because even though a, a, a task a, takes longer than an hour, the next task that is processing the next hour will will start when it was scheduled. So we won't get the, any delay. Better than that, when a task ends and the, we don't need to, the cluster anymore, uh, we terminate the cluster and we free the resources and we stop paying for the, for the cost. Time is money, right? If you think about it, this is very similar to how serverless systems work, right? Because you pay for the resources you need when you do the job, but when the job is done, you free the resources and you stop paying for it. Regarding uh, efficiency, we are pretty much driving our cluster to a 100%. But since we're using Spark over EML, uh, there is some warm-up time uh, that, that takes uh, from our efficiency. So the total efficiency is around 75%. Now, of course, if we reduce the warm-up time, we can uh, get closer and closer to 100% efficiency. There are some ways to do that, and we are already experiencing 
and playing with a running Spark over Kubernetes. If we compare it to the previous system, where in the low hours we were paying for uh, resources we do not need, the efficient efficiency of the previous system was around 30%. Now, if you recall, we just said that the new system is around 75%. So, overall, we are now 60% cheaper than the previous system, which is awesome. Now, let's see the, let's see the mechanics. We use Airflow to schedule and control our pipelines. So, when we need, we need to run a task, let's start. Uh, Airflow, we spin up an EMR cluster between a period of time. Then this EMR cluster will use Kafka to convert the time period into offsets and consume the data within Kafka between those offsets. When there is nothing more to consume the, and the job is done, the cluster will terminate itself and we're going to stop paying for the cost. Great. Now, when we need to run multiple uh, tasks with multiple time periods maybe together we can just spin up more and more isolated pipelines and that will just work so as a result we now run multiple pipelines running running with multiple topics on multiple time periods and it just work as a charm so to see the results, I'm going to pass it back to Ofer. Ofer? OK, thank you, Ido. So we saw the architecture and understand why it should be better. But is it really better? Let's see some results. So the first thing I want to show you is how the system looked before and after. On the left, um, you could see that this is what it looked like when it was doing all these micro batches while it was streaming. And on the right, you could see beyond the transition point, we started doing processing once an hour. So once an hour, uh, we process data and we reduce the amount of data waiting for us in Kafka. What you're looking here are basically the offsets, the amount of lag we have in Kafka. You can also notice that once in a while, we have a bigger gap. This means we missed a run. And as a result, the total data to process the queue goes up. But this is OK, because as you recall, our runs are independent. We could just rerun it again later on. And this is exactly what happens. The system just reruns uh, the, the, uh, that batch job and gets back to normal. In terms of cost, on the left, you can see how the system looked before doing this transition. The daily costs were pretty much the same every day, uh, slightly different if we had to uh, rerun or restart a cluster and run it again. Uh, so you can see the, the, the costs were roughly $850 a day for these two topics we were running. On the right, you can see after the change, the, uh, the amount of money we pay every day changes every day depending on the amount of data that comes in. So this really follows the amount of data. You can also see that there is a huge drop in cost. In total, it's around 60% drop in cost. So if you look at the yearly cost, before we were paying around $400,000 a year, and now we're down to $160,000 a year. That's $240,000 in saving every year just from the move uh, to this system, which is obviously awesome. If you look at the data, uh, these are the bytes we are processing per hour. And you can see this changes uh, from hour to hour and day to day. And our costs are very uh, correlated with that. You can look at the cost graph below in green, and you can see that it follows very nicely the amount of data we process, which is great. It means we have a pretty uh, serverless type of flow and that we are paying linearly with the amount of data, which is a great place to be in. Let's look at how we handle outages, which is something you don't mention, which was an issue for us. And we really wanted to have better outage handling. So this graph shows you the amount of data waiting to be processed in the old system. And you can see that it suddenly shoots up. 
we have we had an outage something was wrong data started to accumulate we had a cluster down or something like that and uh, the amount of data waiting in the queue went up in Kafka and we started a recovery and ended the recovery here the total time uh, for recovering this took six hours because as the as we were trying to recover data we had new data coming in so there was a lot of load on the system let's look at how the new system uh, is handling similar outages so here is the new system you can see it looks a bit different um, here's an outage that started again we had some downtime with something in the system and here's where the recovery completed notice that from the time we started to recover data it took about 40 minutes to recover all the data and the, the reason is here you can even see this on the graph we had five concurrent isolated spark clusters working in parallel uh, chugging along at the data and as a result we completed processing all of that outage and recovered the data within 40 minutes comparing compared to six hours before that's about an 85 percent improvement in the in our recovery times which is awesome and because we have a retention uh, time limit of the data this is a huge improvement for us in this new system let's look at the cluster utilization which was really critical for us uh, Ido mentioned that in the past while we were doing streaming and the cluster was pretty rigid uh, we had a lot of times where the cluster was underutilized here this is a, a, a ganglia which basically gives you metrics about um, the spark clusters uh, you can see that uh, the cluster here is very once it starts processing the data which is that plateau on top uh, it's very stable and it keeps uh, working at a high utilization in this case it's uh, over 85 percent but in some of the other cases it's uh, it's uh, higher than that and over 90 percent which is really nice utilization and if you look at this uh, part this shows you the load on each of the servers in the clusters in the cluster it's uh, it's all red which means they are highly utilized again this is great the clusters are much better utilized and very consistently over time exactly what we wanted all right let's talk about some of the key insights from this project and what you can take with you about the comparison between streaming and batch so the first thing streaming is expensive and in many cases uh, it might not be worth doing unless you really need it for real-time data consider if you really want to go with streaming the other thing is fixed clusters are never perfect uh, during off hours they're very expensive because we have too much capacity that is not really uh, used and is the cluster is basically idling away your money and when we have a lot of high loads uh, they are too slow to uh, to process all the data quickly another critical insight is that recovery is critical to manage you really want to man plan this when you do your architecture this is not something you want to leave as an afterthought uh, to deal with later if you want to have a good life and not too many distractions during your holidays and vacations you definitely want to deal with this in your architecture and make sure that recovery is easy and quick and the last thing is if you introduce isolation and parallelism in your processes uh, and your data pipelines it really allows you to easily scale save on costs and deal with loads in our case the way uh, we approach this is basically splitting the data between fixed time frames and time slots and that gave us the isolations between all the tests and they could be run in parallel in your projects it might be something else that will allow you but you definitely want to uh, think about it all right let's summarize so here are the things we talked about uh, in this talk first the differences between streaming and batch uh, some of the trade-offs and things you should consider when planning such systems uh, we explored one of our projects that used to be a stream and we moved it to a batch and showed you some of the advantages we gained by doing this and we went over some architecture insights that you can take to your own projects conclusions are that streaming has some downsides 
always think if you really need it. Uh, badge can sometimes be an, an alternative. I'm not saying always because sometimes you d really do need streaming, but badge is a definitely a viable alternative. And you should also always consider the costs, the loads on the system, how to recover data, and your uptime of the system. If you want to learn more, here are two talks by colleagues of ours, Streaming with Spark and Kafka, just follow the tiny URL, and Airflow, Kubernetes, and Spark, another interesting talk uh, by them. And if you really want to reach us, we're available on LinkedIn. Here are handles uh, of me, my handle and Edo, Edo's. So feel free to reach out to us. All right, so with that, we'll summarize, we'll, uh, we'll conclude. Thank you very much for coming to our talk. Okay, so we are now in the QA session. Uh, I just check and I didn't see any questions so far. <laughs> so I will probably do one question myself because I'm curious. Did you try with this approach uh, to use like more um, things like spot instances or things like that just to reduce cost? Ah, good question. Ido, you want to take this? Because you dealt a lot with the spots. Yeah, uh, so we did, uh, we, we use spot instances. We actually is using spot inst instances even now. Uh, but we, we, did, we did see uh, that uh, uh, we, we were losing spot instances all the time. So uh, that was the problem. Now, when you instead of running a uh, cluster that run a cluster that running all the time using spot instances that might fail and then you need to re recover from the failed uh, spot instance if you run it in small uh, uh, small runs like, like shortened runs uh, that run like run every hour but only for 20 minutes or 30 minutes you are unlikely to it's unlikely that uh, the spot will be lost so it's like even more uh, resilient yeah can i expand on this Ido? I, I want the old process that was in streaming we <coughs> used spots but uh, because it was a long running process like Ido said we kept losing uh, uh, spots and we had to deal with this it was difficult with, with the batch process because it's short it can recover if you lose spots it's not a big deal we still use spots, but we don't have all these problems we had in the past. Uh, but I also want to mention we're also using instant fleets, which makes it easier. And think about it, instance fleets give you spots depending on availability. And we are starting a cluster every hour, which means that one cluster may use a certain instance type. Another one that starts later on may use something else. So this is really awesome. <laughs> Okay, I have another question. Is uh, why I mean, in this in the batch case, I suppose it's better to have like uh, stronger machines, like beefier machines somehow. Or what was your experience about this? Uh, the nice thing about it is that you don't have to use beefier machines because if you remember, because of the isolation, each batch is working independently. Each batch has one hour of data, and then it could work as long as it needs. So if you have beefier machines, maybe it will finish processing in 20 minutes. If you have weaker machines, it may take an hour and a half. So the, the nice thing about it, we basically disconnected the dependency between the amount of data and the type of machines you use. And now you can use really, ch you can choose the machines depending on the cost. Whatever is the cheapest for you in terms of total cost, you can use because we are now uh, independent of the machine type which is really, really uh, uh, nice, by the way. We s this helped us uh, save a lot. A lot of the savings came from uh, toying with spots and instances and things like that that we had a hard time doing before. OK, okay thanks. Let me just check if there is another question. Yes, uh, the, there are two. Uh, how many partitions were present in the Kafka topic for the batch solution given a time range, Se uh, for example, one hour? How do you determine what offsets do you to read from? Okay, cool. Uh, Ido, you want to take this? I think you love this question. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're using Airflow to uh, spin up the cluster every hour. So uh, uh, we use Airflow uh, uh, timing that uh, tells us uh, uh, like the, when to start and when, when to end. And then we use Kafka uh, to convert the, 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 the timestamp 
to actually uh, Kafka offsets. Like each one of the partitions uh, has its own manage its own offset, right? So uh, when you go to Kafka and ask for uh, um, the offsets for a specific time time frame, it will give you a, a different offset, start and end offset uh, for each partition. And this is how we do that. So, yeah. So in that, the past, in, Ido, can you mute so we, we don't have the echo? In the past, we had uh, we were just reading uh, offsets in Kafka for each partition and and using that to read the data. Now that we use the fixed time slots, we basically go to Kafka, ask it which offset is the specific time we want to start and end, and use that uh, for reading. Regarding the other question you asked, how many partitions we have? So we currently have uh, 1,250 partitions in Kafka for the big uh, topics. And as a result, we're also using clusters with a, a slightly more cores than that. Uh, so each core, each executor is basically going to one partition and reading it. <laughs> 